Hello everybody, this is Gynarchic Awakening here. I'm going to be talking about my views regarding... I'm not going to use the actual title. I'm, I'm, and like, I'm not going to direct it towards anybody. I'm just going to talk about my views regarding trans people, the trans community, and especially what I'm seeing lately. So, I usually see, like, two things. Like, this is what happens when you live in a society with what are known as narrative brains. There are two kinds of brains, typically, that I will see in human society that you will see if you are out in the public. It is a fabric brain or it is a narrative brain. And narrative brains have a tendency to out-populate, out, um, or rather, they are outgrouping fabric brains. So, what is the difference between these two? Well, narrative brains have a tendency to set up an either-or situation, like you're either with me or against me. It's either you're this or you're that. Um, and this is also one of the reasons why, as a species, we have had such a hard time moving on from violence, because it is so easy to get trapped into one narrative or another to the point where you forget to think and embrace your larger humanity. Um, but there are definitely problems with this movement that I'm seeing. I have seen at least four uh, trans individuals who have been connected to mass shootings. Um, I saw what happened in Auckland. That, frankly speaking, was disgraceful. Uh, you are essentially giving your... I mean, again, from, again, from the point of view of trans people, right... Um, if their ideology, if their thinking at the core is going to be, they hurt me, so therefore I'm going to hurt them, that is a very, very dangerous policy. Uh, because what's going to end up happening is that those women who you are assaulting, they're going to talk to their brothers, their fathers, their sons and their cousins, and they're going to come out, and those people are going to be a lot physically stronger uh, than you, a lot of these people are, like two to three hundred pounds. And what they're going to do is they're going to use your violence or the violence that you have rationalized and justified as the rationalization to hurt you back. Essentially, what we have here is we have a cycle of pain, cycle of, of hatred that is going on between certain, not all of them, but certain trans individuals and the general public. Uh, and these kinds of things, they never end well. The, you know, if you hurt someone else and they hear, hurt you, all you're left with is hurt people. And uh, I feel actually very sorry for everybody involved because sometimes we forget that we are human beings because we like to apply labels to things like this person's a this or a that or, or he's a this or that. We forget that we're people. And what the power, the thing about language and why it's so powerful is that we have the ability to use our language to demean each other, uh, to put each other down, or to somehow classify other people as non-humans or not worthy of dignity or respect. And so it is, it is very hard to ride the line there. And as a species, we are starting to run into a problem, which is that um, we... We put ourselves into positions where we can't see a peaceful means forward for ourselves, and so we often use violent language or violent rhetoric, or we end up acting out violence because we're not seeing the changes that we want to see in the world that we see within ourselves, or we're not seeing the acceptance of these changes. And I think that that right there is one of one of our biggest uh, drawbacks as a species is that we uh, have this tendency when we are making these transitions whatever they are to doing stuff like this now personally I think one of the big problems with the the immediate uh, almost the immediate acceptance and embrace of this community is that we didn't consider the long-term consequences neither the trans community or anybody else considered the long-term consequences of what would happen when you tried to forcefully integrate trans people um, into the same spaces that traditionally cis women, well, what they call cis women or religious women, what women have occupied, uh, what girls have occupied. And, of course, when, you're, when you take into account the fact that the political situation has changed, especially in the United States, where imagine that you're a woman, you're capable of being pregnant, 
and then they put a so-called trans woman, and I'm saying so-called because you know, at this point, I don't know if that person is actually a trans woman or if they're lying. Um, you know, that's that really depends on the person themselves. So if you have somebody in the room who has a penis, and they can penetrate you and forcefully impregnate you, and you're living in one of those red states, or you're living in a place uh, where you have no recourse, that's pretty fucking dangerous. Uh, that's not that's not okay. <laughs> um, and also the idea that uh, we should just place these people inside of these spaces and expect other people to somehow magically adapt to these changes. That's not going to happen overnight. People are not just going to adapt to something that is very, very different. Because remember, we've been running on a binary as a species. We, we operate and construct our structures and systems off of binary, right? If you look at, for, the mo for most of our, what is it, bathrooms, men or women, uh, you know, gyms and stuff. Sometimes you have women gyms, sometimes you have male gyms. You know, prison systems, right? You have prison systems for women, prison systems for men. So one of the interesting things about these changes is that there, there was no, like, a, okay, the non-gender, like the gender-neutral bathroom is one thing. However, um, when you don't consider structural changes to society to allow for a more smooth transition for whatever your ideology is or whatever your purpose is, you run the risk of this kind of backlash where people are not only not accepting you, but they view you as a threat, uh, as a threat to them, as a threat to their safety and well-being. Because, uh, you know, let's say that the trans woman hasn't transitioned yet, right? That person is obviously physically stronger or is likely to be physically stronger than the other woman in the jail cell. You know... If you guys started, especially the trans community, if you start talking more with your opposition and stopped invalidating every little thing that they say, maybe you would actually tone down the violence a bit and realize that there are some serious, there are some valid points to consider, and that maybe instead of just trying to force people to accept things, just maybe we should think about this a bit more and realize that it's a lot more complicated than that, and that we can't simply just rush ahead and expect everybody to catch up. That is one thing I've noticed about that particular community, is how, uh, not only how violent some of them act, but how violent their rhetoric ends up being. And they seem to have this notion of, well, um, you know, if you have, what is it, if you have, um, if you tolerate bigots, right, or something, if you tolerate... Nazism, it just grows exponentially or something like that. See, this is the problem that I don't think they understand, which is if you don't have firm leadership, in other words, who is the leader of the trans community? There's actually a problem with the Gynarchy movement as well, but seriously, who is the leader of the trans community? Can somebody tell me who that is? You can't, huh? See, this is a big problem with these movements. If you don't have strong leadership with a strong a person who has strong morals, then your leader, then your movement is destined for disaster. And I view the trans community as having a dis, having a lack of leadership, especially a lack of moral leadership. If you tell people, because again, this they don't think about stuff like this, right? Like if you're teaching other people teaching that, okay, if somebody hurts you, right, if somebody says something to you that is hurtful, that therefore you are justified in punching that person in the face, what happens when you're doing that in front of kids? What, have, what are the moral consequences of, of normalizing violence as a solution to your problem, especially in front of people who haven't even formed a strong moral framework yet? And what about the other people? What about the violence that you're inspiring in return to what's happening to you? <clears throat> you know, I've seen some of these activists use quotes that are that kind of um, are like a callback to Malcolm X, where Malcolm X said that uh, it was it was like Mal uh, was it uh, Magneto said peace was never an option. 
Uh, so in other words, they're saying, and, and again, with the violent rhetoric, that violence is inevitable, uh, that it's us versus them. You know, either we, we <laughs> I guess somehow in their thinking, it's like, um, if we hurt them, they'll stop hurting us. Uh, that's not going to work. Um, and the reason why that's not going to work is because eventually when you hurt somebody's family, some of those people don't give a shit what the circumstances are. They don't care what actually happened. All they see is the people they love being hurt. And in that, you know, in that love, it breeds hatred. And then you have the return. You have the violence being thrown back at you. And this is the reason why I say they have failed leadership, because this is a minority group that has less people than the general population. You are literally outnumbered, and yet you chose to pick a fight with, with a group that has numerical superiority. What the absolute fuck were you people thinking? I just don't get it. I don't understand why people have this mentality of, let's swing no matter what. Do you see the people in the Africoid community collectively rebelling against Caucasoids, killing their, their governors and destroying their... Po you know why they don't do that? Because they're intelligent enough to understand that if they try to start a cycle of, with Caucasoid people, that Caucasoid people could genocide them, at least within the United States. I mean, I'm, I don't know how else to put it, but it's like when you know what your enemy is, See, I feel like Africoids have a much more intelligent way of going about it, where they know the line. They know what not to cross. And when they do cross it, and they cross it deliberately, they are very calculated in how they cross it, because unlike trans, the trans community, which is very... Uh, I, I want to say it's very young in terms of its, its collectivity and how they're getting together, um, and how they're organizing, and how they're, form, how they're forming themselves... Um, the Africoid community has known about their political oppressors for much longer. And so I feel like when you compare these two, the Africoid community in particular does seem to have a better idea of what and who they're dealing with. Whereas this movement, they have no idea what they're, po they're you're poking a bear. And the thing is, if you want acceptance, if you want people to love you and embrace you, you don't use violence as a solution to problems. And also, you know, this whole thing of, well, they're doing it, so why not us? How does two wrongs make a right here? Again, I just don't, I don't get it. It's like, I, I get it. There are, pe there are Nazis who show up at people's rallies. There are people who are hurting your people. But if you keep doing the same thing that you're doing, you're, again, violence just begets violence. It'll just keep going and going and going and going. And then eventually all of us suffer. So my position on it is, I'll call them their pronouns or whatever, I'll say whatever they say, but I don't agree with their prescripted, so their prescripted solution to their problems. I think they're going to end up getting themselves hurt even worse than they are right now because, again, you, you're picking a fight, once again, with a group that has numerical superiority, and eventually those people are going to get together and take one look at you and go, okay, well, you know, <clears throat> we've been trying to do that acceptance thing, and now we see that you guys are becoming increasingly violent. If you look at what happened in Malcolm X's life, Malcolm X, eventually the violence um, <clears throat> turned towards him, where you had two of his own, two people of African heritage shot and killed him. And the thing about violence, and I remember watching something from another YouTuber who said violence, people don't compartmentalize violence very well. Uh, I might have to do a part two. I might do it while I'm walking because i got to get something to eat. But yeah, this is... Um, my personal opinion is I have a live and let live policy. I, at the end of the day, I, you know, if you want to call yourself this or that, yeah, whatever. Um, however, uh, when you don't want to change the structures to accommodate these changes, or you don't want to... or you want to just invalidate everything that your opposition says, the only thing that's left is violence. When you can't... Ha when you can't be, when you aren't willing to entertain other people's points of view or their perspectives, when you're not willing to try to understand where that person is coming from and try to find a third solution or a solution that benefits both parties, then yes, you are essentially making violence the only option that's left.